God bless y'all. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, family. You know, in many ways, I'm still praying for the members of uh, some members of our my family. You know, down in the south, Christianity is like a tradition, and walking into a church doesn't make you saved. But you, some people have that. You know, you grew up in church, you think you're saved, and uh, those who are really redeemed closer to me than some members of my family I grew up with. I'm praying that all of us will be in heaven together, but I'm pretty sure about some of us in here. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got, I got work on my own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, but thank you. Uh, you on the live stream, thank you for logging in. Uh, give us a thumbs up or a like or share uh, with others. Thank you for logging and pray that God's blessing upon you, especially those of you who may be um, looking at th watching us in secret. Is, is You're risking your life by watching this stream. God bless you. May the Lord protect you. Father God, we just bring this service to you. Hallelujah. The worship is not just these songs. And the church is not this building. You brought us into the church the day we received you as our Savior. And uh, you, you wash us clean with your, the blood of your son. Thank you so much. That's when we became part of the church. And we're here. We bring our little churches into this church together to worship and to praise you and to break the bread of your word and to fellowship, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to move in a special way amongst your people, to encourage us, to rebuke us, to... Uh, comfort us lord just to set us our focus are right for the rest of this week and help us to share whatever you give us help us to share with others oh god but we thank you in anticipation of what you will say to us and your presence manifested before us cleanse us lord if we said done or thought anything that hasn't pleased you F from the time we were together last time even until this moment lord we want to be clean and give, lift up clean hands and bring to you a pure heart of worship, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. I have a scripture I want to share with you that came to mind while the men were praying in the back. It's pertinent to, um, if you watch any of the news at all, this, this is Psalm 73. Um, hopefully it will just set our hearts right for worship and just remove away one of the major distractions just the things that are going on in the world truly god is good to israel to such as are pure in heart but as for me my feet had almost stumbled my steps had nearly slipped for i was envious of the boastful when i saw the prosperity of the wicked have, have we been there at least one time this week? Seeing people prosper, have billions and literally trillions of dollars who blaspheme God and think they run this world? Have we run into people that uh, directly that just don't know the Lord and say, Lord, why are you blessing them? And, uh, sometimes we go through stuff. Let me keep reading. Verse, and it, it, in the rest of Psalm, the writer of Psalm gives examples of how the, 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 those who are wicked seem to be getting ahead. It says literally their eyes are bulging out <laughs> because they're, they're, so, they're, they're fat, they're full of, they, they're so full, they seem to have so much abundance. Uh, abundance. Let's go down to verse 15. If I had said, I will speak thus, behold, I will have become untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. So he was getting to the point of despair, just watching all this go on. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakens, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved and my 
and was vexed in my mind, and I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, you know what? It's so wonderful how God puts up with us in our complaining. <laughs> when we see the things go on, it just causes us to grumble. Let's replace the grumbling with thanksgiving. G God is not surprised by all the things that are going on. He's not shocked by the suffering we're going through or the suffering seen in the world, even the wickedness that are going on. God is not like, wow, I didn't know that would happen. He knew what was happening. And he's still in control. Don't let us not be like Bruce, uh, just beasts complaining and grumbling. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. Thank you, Lord. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Who am I, have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And finally, the last verse, verse 28. It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Reminds me of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is like, at the end, it's like, though there's no food in the stalls, no grapes on the vine, yeah, I'm going to praise you, Lord. The wicked seem to be getting over. We are seem to be under the circumstances, but we're going to win in the end. We have a reason to praise. Hallelujah. You know, the devil did his worst when he just spit on Jesus and beat him. Every punch, every kick, every curse. He had already run the victory. Every nail that went into him, it was already finished. The minute he said, Father, not my will, but your be done, he had already won the victory. Oh, Father, we praise you right now. Hallelujah. We praise you right now in the midst of what's going on in this country, what's going on in our lives, what's going on in the world. We honor and praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. Before we sing any song, we praise you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me, God, you're so good, God, you're so good, God, you're so good, you're so good to So teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you every hour. I need you, my one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you you every hour I need you my one defense my righteousness oh God how I need you we bless your name Lord praise you Lord 
He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got you and me, brother. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, sister. In his hands, he's got you and me, sister. In his hands, he's got you and me, sister. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. 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 He's got the whole world in his Find me in this place again, prone to wander, lost in sin. When I confess, I am blessed. I will turn my heart to you. You are faithful and so true. When I confess, I am blessed. There's no better place to be than to sit down at your feet. And to live in fellowship so sweet. When you lead me, I will follow all the way, all the way. When, when you go, I'll go with you all the way, all the way. Joy will come and peace will stay when I trust you and obey. Help me do whatever you say all the way, all the way. up from defeat you have won the victory you will turn grace into praise not a shadow or a fear can abide when you are near by your word I know that you are here when you leave me I will follow all the way all the way when you go, I'll go with you all the way, all the way. Joy will come and peace will stay when I trust you and obey. Help me do whatever you say all the way, all the way. Help me do whatever you say all the way, all the way. But to trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey. Way. 
Joy will come and peace will stay when I trust you and obey. Help me do whatever you say all the way, all the way. Where you lead me, I will follow all the way, all the way. When you go, I'll go with you all the way, all the way. Joy will come and peace will stay when I trust you and obey. Help me do whatever you say all the way, all the way. Help me do whatever you say all the way, all the way, all the way, all the way. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the water, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there's a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my dead left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning, either way I will bow to the things of this world. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. Yes. He who was and still is and will be through it all. Somehow we're made in the space between 
of the things you see and this reckoning I know I will never be I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. But should I ever need reminding? How good you've been to me. I count the joy come every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be And I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to him I can hear the roar in the heavens As the space between west and I can feel the ground shake beneath us As the prison walls caves in Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of who you've been to me? I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be with us in the fire. Hallelujah. You're walking right there with us, Lord. I don't know who in this place is in the midst of the battle, Lord. Or in the live stream. Hallelujah. I can think of some names of people, Lord. I'm not going to say their names, Lord, but I lift them up right now. If you're in the fire or you know someone who's in the fire right now, just take a moment to pray for them. If you're in the fire right now, give him praise. We're going to keep playing it, playing this song. Either pray for someone or start praising yourself. Lord is with us in the fire. He's the fifth man in the fire. that guys Father God we lift up anyone in this room God who may be going through the fire Lord oh God trials of various kinds Lord moved by your precious Holy Spirit that they will see you walking with them and sustaining them Lord like your beloved Apostle Paul who's, you told him my grace is sufficient for you my strength is made perfect in weakness some of us lord you haven't taken away the fire you're purifying us and refining us in it those on the live stream who are going through prolonged sicknesses they're in the fire god i'm asking you before i know you're going to remove it someday ultimately there's healing you may move it in a flash while we're praying 
but they need to know you're with them in the midst of the suffering. In the midst of the pain, the, the vertigo, the upset stomach, the, the whatever's going on, God, you're with them in the midst of it. Help them to know you have not left them. You're closer than the mention of your name. And anyone in here, Lord, that came in here with a burdened heart, may they experience the closeness of your presence, Lord, that you're with them. Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you in advance of what you're going to do. Thank you, Lord. And Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name Jesus. of Jesus. 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 Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Stronghold, 
shine through the shadows, burn like the fire. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is love. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. right now we're going to open the altar if you want to come down and pray this morning just for a few minutes if you have something going on you want some prayer for we want to be here for you
Last time. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is love. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I have a scripture reading, but Pastor Great, I, <laughs> I get one of those feelings again. <laughs> all, right, all right, do you sense something, or is it just me? Pastor, if, if this is unusual for us, if anyone feels the word of quick word from the Lord, I just give you just a couple minutes to share. It just could be me, but it's, I don't. There's no coordination here. If, if, if anybody has a word from the Lord. Otherwise, I'm just going to read the scripture. His story, there's been more uh, broken marriages put back together. There's been more addictions that have been broken. There's been strongholds uh, of, of poverty to be broken, uh, hunger to be broken and, uh, through his word. And his word is Lord Jesus. Amen. Like the fire. He is still the chain breaker. He's still the way maker. He's still the miracle worker. And he is the promise keeper. He is the light in the darkness. Hallelujah. Amen. Hear that today. Amen. His promises are yes and amen. Mm -hmm. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's on the throne. He's in control. He nor sleeps nor slumbers. He knows every thought. He hears every word. He sees everything. He knows everything. Love him today. We love you, Lord. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. We could dismiss my, our children, and you could be seated. Welcome everyone this morning and welcome those online. We just thank you that you have decided to come and be a part of our service today. I'm going to be honest with you, this is going to be a tough one this week if you've read ahead, but if you hadn't, well, you'll see. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your understanding and your guidance Lord, there are many things that we don't understand. There are many things that we can look at and read and, and try to process and, and just scratch our heads. But, Lord, we know that you have a word for us. Through every word that is written in your word, there's a word for us. 
And so we come this morning, Lord, giving you this service, giving you this day. Give us understanding and give us wisdom and guide our steps as we go through this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be back in Judges chapter 19 this week. And the title of our message this morning is The Short But Wide Road to Destruction. The short but wide road of destruction. And last week we finished looking at Micah and the Levite priest who were both of questionable character. And after Micah stole from his mother and then returned the silver that he stole from her, she rewarded him by having an idol made. And he had a shrine. He built his whole shrine. And then when this Levite priest came by, he hired him to be his own personal priest, not to worship God, but the images and the idols of which he had in his home, in that shrine. And all was well until the men of the tribe of Dan showed up. <laughs> and they stole his gods. They stole his idols. And they took the Levite priest as well, leaving him with nothing. He had built his whole world around a false god. And what did he say? You've come and you've taken my gods. What else have I got left? Well, have you considered the holy God, the real God, the true God? Well, he didn't. He was depressed. He was angry. He was upset. But he was also not able to, in his strength to do anything about it. If you create a God, you have to defend it because it can't defend itself. And in this case, he lost everything that he set to prove and to be. And it goes to prove that no God created by man has any power. It's a lifeless form that cannot defend itself or move itself from the shelf of which it's placed. Jeremiah 10, 5 says, in speaking of idols, it says, They're upright like a palm tree, and they cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot go by themselves. Do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. An idol has no power to do evil or good. The, evil or the power of evil and good comes within what we choose to do with the information that's put before us. The idol can do nothing. But we can make it evil because we worship it. But it's just an image. It's just sitting there. It has no power of good and evil. It has nothing to offer. And today, we must not allow anything to come between us and the living, holy God. Idolatry comes in many forms, not just a carved or molded image. Religion itself can become idolatrous. If we focus on the things of God, the things about God, rather than God himself. And I will tell you this morning that the gifts of the Holy Spirit in a lot of places have become idol, uh, idols. Because people are focused on, you've got to have this gift, you've got to have this gift. To the extent, to some places, if you don't have this gift, you're not even saved. Well, I'm sorry, the gift only comes after salvation. It doesn't bring salvation. And so we must never find ourselves looking at the things of, of God, or looking at the things of the world, or looking at anything within ourselves, or our families, or our lifestyle, or anything, and say that this is something, and make it an idol. We're to give all that over to the Lord. Now, this week we are at a difficult passage. And this is his account of, a, of another Levite priest, his concubine. And we're going to show the depravity of men who turn from their God and serve their own fleshly lust. So let's begin in Judges chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. We're going to get, it's a lot of reading today, so bear with me as we go through. And it came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But his concubine played the harlot against him, and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah, and was there four whole months. Then her husband arose and went after her, to speak kindly to her and bring her back having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him so she brought him into her father's house and when the father of the young woman saw him he was glad to meet him 
Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning, and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. So they sat down, and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young man's father, or young woman's father said to him, Please be content to stay all night and let your heart be merry. And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him. So he lodged there again. Then he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. But the young woman's father said, Please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. And when the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father said to him, Look, the day is drawing toward evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early so you may, may get home. However, the man was not willing to spend that night. So he arose and departed and, and came opposite of Jebus, that is, Jerusalem. And with him were two saddled donkeys his concubine also with him. And they were near Jebus, and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, Come, please, and let us turn aside into this city to Jebusites and lodge in it. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into the city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. So he said to his servant, Come, let us draw near to one of the, these places and spend the night in Gibeah or in Ramah. So here we meet another Levite priest living in the mountains of Ephraim. And why he isn't in Shiloh, Shiloh where the tabernacle was located, it's not clear. But like the priest we saw in the story of Micah, he seemed to be away from his calling. He was in an isolated place by himself. He had a concubine, he had a servant, had a donkey or two. He was content. But a, as a Levite priest, he should have been serving in the temple. He should have been serving there in the tabernacle, but he was far away from there. And we read that he took the concubine, and it doesn't say wife here. But as we read into the story, he's referred to as her husband in verse 3. And the woman's father is referred to his father-in-law, and he's called the man's son-in-law. So they looked at this as a marriage. It's interesting that there are two Hebrew words used for concubine in verse 1, where all the rest of the times it's mentioned is only one word. And the first word, ishaw nashim, it means adulterous wife or woman. And the second Hebrew word is Pilagesh, Pilagesh, and it's of a cert uncertain derivation, but it does mean concubine or paramour. Now, I didn't know what a paramour was, so I looked it up. And it's basically an illicit or secret lover. So it appears that this woman, while the Levite priest, while the woman's father looked at this relationship as a wife or a legal bonding, it was not recognized as such in a spiritual manner. She was not his legal wife. He tried to treat her that way. The father-in-law accepted him as the, the son-in-law, but she was still a concubine. She was not his wife. And the author of this book, which is thought to be Samuel, didn't recognize this as a legitimate marriage under God. Now, this woman's father showed kindness to the man, and in their culture it was common for them to be over-hospitable. <laughs> And as we read, hey, look, come on, sit down. Let's just have another drink. Let's have another, a little bit more food. So he sat down. The day went away. Hey, let's spend the night. So he did, on and on and on. Now, we'll say this. Had he listened to his father-in-law that last time, things might have turned out differently than they turned out because he left late in the day. Had he left in the early, he would have been to make it all the way home with a few rest stops. But here now, night came. They had to make a stop. They couldn't sleep out in the open. And he said, let's go to a, a place in Israel. I don't want to go to a foreigner's place. It's not safe there. So let's go to a place 
in Israel. So finally, they go on their way. Now notice she's willing to go with him. After playing the harlot and leaving for four months, she's willingly ready to go back. She evidently thinks he really cares for her to have come all this way and to woo her back. So they need a place to stay. It's getting late. And again, the servant suggests a closer place, but the priest says, no, we need to be among our own people. It's safer among our own people. So let's go there. So they made their way to Gibeah, which is in a town that's located among the tribe of Benjamin. Let's continue reading. Verse 14, And they passed by and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there to go in to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. Just then an old man came in from his work in the field of evening, who was also from the mountains of Ephraim, and he was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city, and the old man said, Where are you going, and where do you come from? So he said to him, We're passing from Bethlehem in Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I am from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah, and now I'm going to the house of the Lord. But there's no one who will take me into his house. Although we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys, and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant, and for the young man who is with us, your servant. There's no lack of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. Just to kind of stop there for just a second. This man knew this is not a safe place. You don't want to be out here. Come, stay with me. So he brought him into his house and gave fodder to the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. Verse 22, as they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perver perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. And we all know what that means. They were wanting the homosexual relationship with this man that came to stay but the man the master of the house went out to them and said to them no my brethren i beg you do not act so wickedly seeing this man has come into my house do not commit this outrage rage look here's my virgin daughter and the man's concubine let me bring them out now humble them and do with them as you please but to this man do not do such a vile thing but the men would not heed to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her out to them. And they knew her all night and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. When her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, there was his concubine falling at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. And he said to her, Get up, let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey, and the man got up and went to his own place. So this story takes a dark turn, doesn't it? This has a strange resemblance to what we read in Genesis regarding Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19, verses 1 through 8. Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. You may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly, so they turned into him and entered the house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. And before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called a lot and said, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. 
So Lot went out to them through the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brethren, do not do so wickedly. See, now I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason they've come under the shadow of my roof. Now, the difference between the story of Sodom and the story of today is Sodom was a pagan Gentile city. They were already practicing false gods, serving false gods, serving their own lusts. They were already in a place of depravity. For Sodom to even be there was a mistake. We've looked at that before when we've studied Genesis. We saw, why did Sodom wind up there? Well, when him and Abraham, sep Abraham separated, Sodom looked and saw the, the best land. He looked toward Sodom, saw the city, said, hey, that's where I want to be. The next thing, we find him sitting in the gate. The next thing, we see him a leader in Sodom. And the next thing, we see the angels coming. To destroy the city. And they had to pretty much snatch him out. And his wife turned back. We know that story too. She, she didn't want to leave. And so here we have. They're in a place that they shouldn't be. They're in a mindset they shouldn't be. And yet that's where they find themselves. The, the men of Gibeah. They were not. A pagan people. They were Israelites. From the tribe of Benjamin. This is who did this. And this priest avoided a pagan foreign city because of this very behavior. He said, it's not safe to go to a foreign place. Let's go among our own. Obviously, he hadn't seen how bad and how far the Israelites had fallen from different tribes. We read last week the Danites. They stole those idols from Micah. And what did they do? They worshipped them the entire time the tabernacle was in Shiloh. They worshipped those idols there in the tribe of Dan. That's how far they fell. What we know from history and from reading the word is that all the tribes of Israel had fallen away from God. And we'll, look what we read constantly in the book of Judges. There was no king at that time, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. They had turned away from God. All the tribes had turned away. The tribe of Benjamin had really become depraved. They allowed themselves to go this way. And this is what happens when you deny God for who he is and turn to idolatry and wickedness. It's truly a short but wide road that leads to destruction. You let the culture in the front door, then truth is overshadowed. Truth is overshadowed. Romans tells us this in Romans 1, 24 through 32. It says, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves a penalty of the error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do the things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things and disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God and that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same but also approve 
of those who practice them. This is where we're heading today in our culture. This is what's going on in the midst of who we are and where we are. Our culture has also fallen into idolatry. Our culture has fallen into sexual sin. Our culture has fallen into everything that we just read here because they've taken their eyes off of God. A nation that was founded on godly principles is no longer looking to God as their direction. They are now seeking what is their own. Whatever their heart desires. All about me. We talk about this over and over. The me generation. Well, it's not just the younger generation. The parents let it up. They're the ones that fed these kids this thing. By not taking the time to raising your children in godly manners and teaching them about godly things, what happens is the kids find out, well, it's all about me. I can do what I want. Go where I want. Be what I want. And then, then where does that lead us? It leads us into a culture today where they can't even look in the mirror and determine whether they're a boy or a girl anymore. It, it's, it's crazy. But it's the culture, and it's the culture has gone away from God just as the Benjamites find themselves in this place, this is where we're heading here. And for the church, there are still people that call themselves Christians and approve of this behavior. Allowing homosexual pastors in the pulpit. Lesbians pastors in the pulpit. The Bible is very clear on this point. And it's not a condemning point. I'm not condemning people. What I'm saying is, is that when you take your eyes off of Jesus, when you go into your own way, this is the way it goes. It can't go anywhere but down. And once you begin to worship the creature and not the creator, then you begin to lust after the creature, whether it's male or female. It doesn't matter anymore. I want it. I have to have it. The desire is the flesh. You give your flesh its desire, then it's going to consume you. Remember what, what uh, God spoke to, to Cain. Cain was angry. He was angry because he didn't have his sacrifice, was not accepted as Abel's was. And God spoke to Cain. And he said, why, is your ca why are you so downcast in your countenance? Why are you feeling this way? Do you not know that... You know, anger is not going to help you. Sin is crouching at your door, but you must master it. God spoke those words to Cain right before Cain killed his brother. Cain was about Cain. Didn't care about his brother. Didn't care about his mom and dad. And he didn't care about God. Now, you got to understand and think about the picture we're talking about here. God, while they were kicked out of the garden, God still spoke to them directly. It wasn't a prophet. It wasn't a preacher that came by and talked to Cain. God was still speaking to them. He heard straight from God's voice, sin is crouching at your door. If you do right and walk uprightly, you will be accepted. But Cain was so angry and allowed his emotions, to, his emotions to take control that he took it out on his brother and killed his brother. And so here we see now in, in, in where we're at today. You cannot combine your fleshly nature with the Spirit of God. They will not coexist. They will not blend. You cannot bring them together and say, it's okay for me to walk in my flesh and say I walk in the Spirit. You're lying to yourself. You're deceiving yourself. You're deceiving everybody else. The one you think you're deceiving is God, and He is not deceived. He knows the heart. He knows every thought. Where can I hide from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your love? psalmist david that's what he wrote you can't you cannot flee you cannot hide we shouldn't want to it's sin sin is what causes us to want to hide from god that's what adam and eve did once they sinned what did they do oh we're naked we better go hide so they go so fig leaves together god's searching for them he knows where they are 
When God comes looking for you, he's not calling your name, wondering where you're at, hiding. He knows exactly where you're at. He knows where you're positioned. He knows where you're crouched, which tree you're behind, and why you're there. If he calls your name and says, where are you? He's wanting you to step out and say, I've sinned. I'm sorry. I have to confess. Instead of going to the next tree and keep running from God. Listen, the forest is not big enough to hide from God. Even those big sequoia trees, you can't hide from God. It's impossible. But men try. And for the church today, for all who are believers in Jesus Christ, I call upon you to make a stand. Make a stand. And I'm not talking about carrying signs out of condemnation. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we go and protest. I'm not saying we do any of those things. I'm saying you make a stand first on your knees. And you get on your knees before God. And you confess your sin. Confess your complacency. Confess all the things that's held you back from being and walking in God's truth. And once you've done that, then say, oh God, how do I love the lost and stand against and speak truth against these cultural movements that are demonically influenced. And only God can give us that balance. And, I be and believe me, I haven't got it yet. <laughs> I struggle every day with God. This is what your word says. This is what we're supposed to preach. This is what we're supposed to teach. This is what we're supposed to believe. And yet we've got this whole culture out here that if you say one word, you're condemned. How do we handle that? How do we deal with that? By the Spirit of a living God, he will put you in the place to speak when you need to speak, to say what needs to be said. If you're condemned, let it be so. You're not condemned by the one that matters. And you have to stand. And in the words of Joshua, Joshua 24, 15, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites, for us today, the gods of our culture, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is what we're called to. It's going to be against the culture we cannot blend with them we cannot say it's okay you you are born this way it, we cannot say it's all right because god sees and loves everybody you're all children of god listen that's the biggest lie that even a lot of the church believes today every person is not a child of god only those who are adopted into the kingdom through jesus christ is a child of god we're all god's creation but we're not children of God until we turn away from our flesh and receive Jesus and receive all the truth of his word. That's when you can call yourself a child of God. Otherwise, you're lying again to yourself. The heart of man is deceitful above all things. You'll lie to yourself. And we tell ourselves lies every day. If you don't believe it, go look in the mirror and tell how beautiful you are. For most of us, we know we're not really being truthful. For some of us, like my wife, it's true. I just gained some points. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Now, looking at our characters in this story, we notice a couple of things. This Levite priest didn't care for his concubine as it first appeared. Maybe... This is why she left to play the harlot the first place. Maybe she didn't knew his character wasn't all that good toward her. Didn't really care about her. She left, played the harlot, went to her father's house. We don't know this for sure. But when these men surrounded the house, demanded that he come out to have him carnally, what does he do? <whistles> Throws her right out the door. Didn't care a thing for her. Didn't care a thing for her. If he truly cared for her, he would have fought for her. This is bad on him. But we have to also look at the culture of their day and how they often viewed women, which is a shame. But it's the way it was in these days. We saw it in a couple of times. Lot himself offered his daughter, both of his daughters, to the men of Sodom, willing to throw them out. Take them. Do what you want with them. This is how he viewed the women. And this man who brought them to stay offered his daughter and the concubine to these evil men. So much for chivalry. 
so much for really showing that you care for someone. But this is what they did. So you have to understand, in their culture, when you brought somebody into your home, that took priority over anything else. You now were their covering. That's how they viewed it. So they would toss anything else out in order to protect the one they brought into their home. Doesn't make much sense to us looking at it, but that's how they viewed it. That's how they did it. So much for defending the one you love. He obviously, this, this Levite priest cared more for himself than for her. Now notice, after they raped and abused her all night, she crawls to the man's door with her hands on the threshold. And this is his response in the morning. Get up, let's be going. Shake it off. You'll be all right. Again, it makes no sense. There was, it was cold, cruel. There wasn't even a word of, oh, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Are you okay? Didn't even offer that. Just get up. Let's go. Been a long night. Huh. Yeah, for her. She went through a night of hell because he threw her to the wolves and didn't have any compassion or concern for her well-being. So now, he returns home, puts her on the donkey. She's dead. And rather than giving a proper burial, he continues to show his disregard for her after her death, which he brought on. Verses 29 and 30. We entered his house. He took a knife laid hold of his concubine and divided her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has ever been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. This story gets darker as we go through it. I don't know what was really going on in his mind. Obviously, he was angry that any Israelite, one of his own kinfolk, really, would do something this depraved. But this was an awful way to send a message, wasn't it? He could have gotten on his donkey and traveled from tribe to tribe and said, this is what they did to my wife or my concubine. This is what they did and plead with them. But he didn't. He sent this awful message to Israel. Now, as a priest, or even just an Israelite, you're not supposed to touch a dead body. Obviously, in a case like this, he had to. But he could have buried her and then went through a cleansing process, is what they would do. There was a ceremonial washing and cleansing of time, and then they would go through that. But he didn't do any of that. This was considered unclean. But not only did he mishandle her body, he then dismembered her. It's like a shock attention getter. That was his goal. He wanted the attention of all the tribes of Israel and all the leaders. So he chose to do it this way. And it did get their attention, as we'll see in the next chapter how they respond to this. They all came out in outrage. But to summarize what we've studied this morning, there's no one immune to sin. Israel, God's chosen people, promised by Abraham, this is where they found themselves. Now, we've seen over and over in their history how they were taken into captivity because of their sin and their rebellion. And God told them over and over and over again, listen, when you enter this land, now mostly he was talking about when they went in to conquer. But he said, if you go in, do not intertwine and intermingle 
with this group or this group. Don't do it. If you do and you wind up marrying some of these women, their idols, their gods will seduce you and they will bring you into worshiping them. Rather than holding true to who you are in me, who you're supposed to be in God, you will go after whatever else is over there. He gave them the warnings. They didn't listen. They were supposed to drive out all of these things. We, we talked about that last week. Uh, in Joshua, when Joshua took over from Moses, they went out to conquer the territory. But they were afraid. They were disobedient. They didn't follow fully through with what God told them to do. And it angered God. And he said, here's the deal. I'm going to leave some of them now. And they're going to be a thorn to you. And so all of these nations that are still they were supposed to be dispersed and gone are now hanging on. Some of them by, the, by, by a little string, but they're still hanging on, and they're jabbing at Israel, poking at them. And instead of Israel going to the Lord in full repentance and coming back and taking up what God told them to do initially, they just welcomed them in in a lot of ways. The ones who weren't giving them a problem, they just let them be. Next thing you know, they've got some of them as wives. Next thing you know, they're serving their gods. Next thing you know, they've turned from God completely. Next thing you know, they're doing what the Benjamites were doing. See, sin progresses. It doesn't regress. Until you repent from sin, it will continue not only to hold on to you, but it will continue to pull you in. And it gets worse. And it gets worse. And it gets worse. Now, I don't know if, if, if for sure if, if some of the stories that you've read about some of these serial killers are true, but I've heard this in more than one case. It started with simple this, and then that didn't satisfy anymore. And then they progressed to the next thing. Well, that didn't satisfy anymore. Then they progressed to this, and it didn't satisfy. And finally, they're raping and murdering women and leaving their bodies all over the place. Ted Bundy was one that said this. This is where it led, because he didn't deal with it when he should have. And this is the whole point of the message that we're looking at today. We all, all come to this place. Well, we have to make a choice. Are we going to serve God or are we going to serve the idols of the culture? And we can't pick both. You can't pick both. You can't. Somebody said you can't have your foot on the sidewalk and one in the street. You're still going to get hit. And the part that's in the sidewalk is going to get tumbled over the rest of you. This is why the Bible is very clear about not being unequally yoked in relationships, in business deals, in any kind of way. We're not to be there. Now, it's not that we separate ourselves and hide from the culture. We're in the culture because God left us here to be a light to the culture. We're not to run and hide from the world, but we're not to intermingle with the world in a way to say, now we can be like you. you can be, we can all come together as one. This is the lie of global religion. The global religion says, oh, we can take the good stuff from everybody's teaching and we can all live in harmony together. That's what the coexist thing means. And they have no clue, no clue what truth is because they've only taken bits and pieces, pick your own and make your own truth. And next thing you know, when one stands upon the solid word of God, the full counsel of God's word, they're alienated. They're the hater. They're the evil one. They're the, not the tolerant one. Well, listen, the people that are the most tolerant supposedly hate Christians. They're not tolerant toward God's people because God's is absolute truth. They can't handle absolute truth. Only abstract truth. It is what they want it to be. But God's truth doesn't change. God doesn't change. And so we have this situation that we're dealing with here. Now, again, this is where they found themselves because of the idols and the gods of the pagan nations. They became like them. Now, we too, as a church today, have our warnings. First, we can glean everything from the Old Testament that we read. We see it. Paul wrote, I give you these as examples. Not to fall into rebellion. Not to fall into disobedience. 
I'm giving this to you so that you understand that this is when you turn away from God, this is what happens. And a lot of the Old Testament, particularly when we read through it, that's exactly what we see is the disobedience got them to this point. It got them to this point, to this captivity, to that captivity, to this deprivation. Over and over and over we see it. Paul gave us the warning. Don't don't look at that and say, oh, well, they were God's people, so it's okay. He also said, should we continue in sin? Absolutely not. Grace abounds, but the grace is only available when you repent. Now, let me rephrase that. His grace is upon us even when you don't. That's the part of his mercy right now. But that line is drawn. And if we do not repent before we take our last breath, that grace is over. And we face judgment. That's not a, that's not a place we want to find ourselves repentance means to turn away from to go in a different direction (coughs) don't keep on the same path now pray that the churches across the united states particularly united states there are some around the world as well will turn back from the cultural influences that we've allowed to come in and get back to the full counsel of god's word to get back to our first love With no compromise and no lies. Our warnings specifically for the church are in the letters to the churches written in Revelations chapter 2 and chapter 3. I encourage you to go back and reread those over and over again. And then ask God as you're reading this, Lord, where do I fall in these seven churches? Because only two out of the five did not get major, major chastisement. Five out of the seven, they got, they got big warnings to the point that if you do not repent, I will remove your lampstand from its place. Now, that's heavy. And you can really get into the once saved, always saved on that one, can't you? I believe what he's saying is that you can call yourself a believer And you can do all these things, and maybe at one point you were doing the right things, but because you didn't have a relationship with your first love and hang on to that, now you're not doing the right things anymore, and sin has crept in the front door, and I will remove that from my presence. It doesn't mean that that people are losing their salvation. It means that people have never really understood what it meant to be and abide in Jesus Christ to begin with. To allow this stuff to come in the front door. See, our culture, the cultural church of the United States is all about show. It's all about big. How big a building can you get? What about the light show? And the timing. And everything's got to be perfect. And you got to make sure you put on a good show. If you don't, they're not going to come back. Okay, now we got their attention. We got the lights. We got the sound. We got everything going on. Flashing, good, this, that, and the other. I remember back. Back years ago, I went to a concert. Y'all remember Mylon Lefevre? Some of you don't remember. Okay, well, anyway, Mylon Lefevre, he was the son of uh, the Lefevres who did a lot of gospel music. But he was more into the rock and roll. He was a rebel. But he got saved, and I don't know about his relationship with God today. I don't really know what it was then. But I went to a concert of his, Mylon Lefevre and Broken Heart. They were at the Mount Perrin North Gym back in 1970-something. Eight, maybe nine. And I walked in, and I've never seen anything like it. The gym was packed. They had a huge stage set up. And all of a sudden, the lights went out. And poof, these lights come on. And I mean, they're crisscrossing everywhere. And smoke's coming up. And it's all, And these guys come out with silver suits on. <laughs> and when the lights hit them, it's like, poof, right in your face. And they sang a lot of rock and roll Christian stuff. I, t- today, I couldn't tell you a word they sang, but they had everybody's attention. Now, again, I'm not judging their heart. I'm just saying that that particular time is when things begin to shift. See, the, 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 the movement, the Jesus movement, the Maranatha mo- movement, all the praise and worship, the contemporary stuff that was coming out in the 60s and the 70s was all about God. It was all about worship. That was what was happening, the writing, the creativity. But then all of a sudden, business stepped in. 
and business said, hey, we need to make money on this stuff. And so the writing changed. Well, what's popular? What's acceptable? What do people want? Well, they want the show. They want this. They want the me stuff. It's all about them. So let's write Christian music all about us now. We don't need to praise God in it. Look at what I'm going to get. I'm this in God. I'm that in God. This is who I am in God. My identity. Listen, your identity is in God, but you need to give him praise for it and quit standing there and patting yourself on the back because you got something. Our identity is in him, and it's in this relationship that we have with him. But we've lost that. And not, then it comes out of the culture uh, of, the, of the Christian music scene, now moves into we adopt all these songs. Now, we're cautious about that. We did do a Hillsong song today. Beautiful song, worshipful song. I don't have a problem taking a song from any group that's worshiping God. I'm not going to throw them all out, throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's an old southern saying. But at the same time, Johnny and I have had this conversation. I trust him explicitly because I know God has anointed him as a worship leader here to pick the songs that are worshiping God, not pick songs that are identified about me or you. That's not who we're supposed to be about. But when that happened, all of a sudden, this moves into the church. All right, so now the church has this contemporary scene. What happens is people begin to allow the music of the day to become their theological, you know what I'm trying to say, their doctrine, their theology. And these songs are not very deep. And so this becomes their identity. Well, the next thing you know, the pastors and the teachers, and they're saying, wow, well, if this is the way the, the culture's going, we need to make sure we're teaching in line with that because we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to make them mad. We make them mad, they'll leave. They leave, they take their money. Then we can't pay the bill. So let's just tone it all down a little bit. We don't talk about the cross. We don't talk about the blood of Jesus. Don't want to talk about this. Don't want to talk about that. And we definitely can't talk about sin and repentance. And nobody would come back. And here we have the cultural church of the United States today. See, here's, as I said a while ago, sin progresses. And until you stop it by getting on your knees and repenting before a holy God and once again saying, God, I want my relationship, my religion, if you will, to be holy all about you, not about this other garbage, not about this other stuff. If you don't do that, what happens is it starts here. The church gets watered down. The nation goes down the hill as we've seen it because the church is not standing for truth anymore. And if the church is not standing for truth, the nation goes the way it goes. And here we are now heading so close, so close to what we just read about in this story this morning. And think about it. Some of the stories that you hear in the news today. The transgender who went up and shot up the Christian school. What did the media do? Immediately defended the transgender. And who paid for her funeral? A lot of the people at the Christian school raised the money to pay for the funeral of her. Now, I'm not saying that that was the wrong thing to do. Maybe God convicted their heart and said, you know what, we need to show love even in the midst of a bad situation. But the point I'm making here is that, that the focus was all about them. And newscasters were told, do not use transgender in this story. They were told not to. Why? Because it painted a bad picture on what they're lifting up as being glorious and acceptable and wonderful. See, this is the culture that we're in now. What was considered good is now considered evil. What is considered evil is now considered good. Isaiah said it was coming, and it's here. Paul wrote about it in Timothy. In the last days, perilous times will come. We're in perilous times, spiritually speaking. And if you think that your cultural stuff around you is going to be your, your security, I'm telling you, it won't. It's going to be right out the window. The time is coming. It'll be right out the window. We're on a short but wide road to destruction. And we already see the ancient gods resurfacing. They're influencing through all these cultural movements. Their names aren't the same. Baal is not called Baal anymore. Ashtor is not Ashtor anymore. But they are gods of sexuality. They're gods of idol worship. They're gods of uh, Molech. 
is a God of, of, of uh, death, and our, that's the, the re- resurrection of him is through the abortion industry. All these gods are present today, and our culture has fallen into them. And if the church and this nation don't repent, God is going to bring upon us the consequences for the actions. It's coming, and it's going to bring all of these things that we're seeing. He will let this country go into a depraved mind, and it's already started. It started in our leadership, and it's spreading. It's spreading. Change is coming. Change is coming. It's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be easy. But we as believers need to stand firm. And all of these things that we're seeing and reading today in our study is going to be commonplace in our society. A relationship with Jesus Christ is all we will be able to stand upon. And every ounce of security that we think we have in this world is sinking sand. So the question is, do we know him? Not about him. Not a religion, not an experience, not a day of the week. Do we know him? Do we know him? Matthew seven thirteen through 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. And we're seeing that today. Our nation, our culture, the world, and even some that call themselves a church on Sunday mornings are, fall, are falling into this. They've fallen into this wide road. But it goes on to say, but narrow, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Listen, those few are still out there. There are few out there right now that need Jesus. And that's why we're still here. That's why God hasn't moved. That's why he hasn't closed the door in the chapter of this yet. Because there's still some that need him. You may be the one that witnessed to and lead the last Gentile into the, <laughs> into the kingdom of God. Or Jew. I mean, there's still there's Jewish Christians today. But specifically, this period of grace is for the Gentiles. That's what Paul told us. He said, but now, he said this is the season. But once the last Gentiles come in, God's turning his back, focus back on the Jews. And it's not going to be pleasant at that point. And so well, this is something we need to understand. This change has already arrived in our culture. Are we going to stand firm in what we believe? Or are we going to be swept away because we built our house on a false religion, a false God, an idol, but not the true living God through Jesus Christ? He's our answer. He's our hope. He's all that we have. And we need to make sure which road we're on. Which gate are you going to go through? Oh, this is the easy way. Look, it's wide, it's open. Yeah. But think about it this way. When Jesus said that it's easier for uh, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich man to get into heaven, think about what he's really saying there. A narrow road means you've got to unload some baggage. Now, there is a gate called the eye of the needle, and the camels did have a tough time getting through it. They would have to unpack the camel's back, take everything off, get it down on its knees and get it through there and then bring all the stuff back in, reload the camel. That's one reference into how this is actually meaning. It's a very literal reference that Israel could understand. That's why he said it the way he said it. But when he said rich men, he's talking about those who are rich within themselves, rich of their own goodness, rich of their own satisfaction, rich of their own wealth and things that they've built. If they're not really to unload that, they're not going to be able to get through that gate. So what are you carrying? Unload it. (laughs) Come through the narrow gate. Because the other is leading to destruction. And right now we're seeing it happening right in front of us. So Father, I come to you this morning. And I just pray that you will continue to prepare our hearts for the change that's coming, Lord. Not, Not to put us in fear. We're not to be afraid. 
Lord, you don't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Lord, perfect love cast out all fear. Because fear leads us to, to fear of punishment. But we're not to be afraid of punishment because we are delivered already from the wrath of God. Through Jesus Christ, we are spared the wrath of God. So therefore, why, do we, why are we afraid? Let us be bold in our relationship with you. Let us stand upon it. Let us walk upon it. Let us be who you want us to be and to do what you want us to do. We love you, Lord. We desperately need you because we can't do it within ourselves. And may the Spirit of God change each heart and bring each heart into a place. Into a place, Lord, where we're looking at you as our source. Nothing in this world. We can't blend with it. We can't mix it up. We can't coexist with it. We're in the world, but we're not of it. May we stand firm in you. And I just pray for this church, the church of this country. I pray for the church in this world. I pray for this nation that, God, you would relent from the, the consequences that are coming. But I also know when I pray that, Lord, that it's very well written and very well clear in the New Testament and what's happening going to happen in Revelation, that the time is coming that this has to happen. These things must come to pass. But it's going to be on your timetable. May we be awake and alert as we pray for discernment and wisdom that you guide us through these perilous times that we live in. We depend upon you and we thank you and we praise you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God's word, we have praised him in song. We have shared sweet fellowship a few moments long as we leave this place in Jesus' tender care. We will share love with people everywhere. May God keep us till we gather here or we meet in the air. We have heard God's word we have praised him in song. We have shared sweet fellowship a few moments long as we leave this place in Jesus' tender care. We will share his love with people left. week, everyone.